This week we're going to take a look, a brief look at the second church in the book of Revelation, the seven letters to the seven churches, the church at Smyrna, followed by a prophecy update. So let's just, by quick way of review, John wrote the book of Revelation probably in the late, uh, the last part of the last decade of the first century AD, around 95 AD. If anybody tells you he wrote it in 70 AD or before 70 AD, have them give you proof. They won't be able to give you proof that he did. I don't think there's any valid proof out there that he wrote it earlier than 70 AD. Now some people say that because they have to say that because the temple, John saw had a vision of the temple in Revelation chapter 11 and because the temple was still standing they say well he must have wrote the vision before the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. It's people like Hank Hanegraaff and other people like that, they're preterists, they believe all prophecy was fulfilled by the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, and the only thing that has to happen now is the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, Revelation, the first part of Revelation chapter one is John is told to write about the things you have seen, then he's told to write about the things which that are, that's the seven letters to the seven churches in chapters two and three, and then the things that shall be here after which take up uh, the rest of the book. So this week we're gonna take a look, we're in this section where he's writing about the things that are. Now by way of review, the seven churches, the letters to the seven churches have multiple purposes. First of all, the admonitions that are given to the seven churches by the Lord Jesus Christ, and this is the Lord Jesus Christ direct letter to each of these seven churches. These admonitions have applicability to each local church. You will find elements of each the descriptions of each of the seven churches in each local church. So it applies to virtually every church. It also has a personal application in the life of the believer. We'll talk a little bit about that today when we talk about the church of Smyrna. It also has a prophetic aspect. When John wrote it, it's very interesting that if you go through history, there is uh, the seven churches seem to line up with the eight, the, you know, Ephesus, the first church, was the first age of the church. Laodicea will be the last age of the church. Um, and these churches go through. The first church is the church in Ephesus, the church that is not lasting. You've left your first love. That age went from about Pentecost to 100 AD. The church at Smyrna, uh, the persecuted church, that church is what we'll talk about today. Uh, that went up to about 312 AD. That's the time of Constant Constantine, the Emperor Constantine. The Church of Pergamum, the Church of Thyatira, the Church of Continual Sacrifice, which represents the age of the Roman Catholic, predominant Roman Catholic Church. Continual Sacrifice being a perfect picture of Rome's view that Jesus has to be re-sacrificed again and again and again. Um, that's the church at Thyatira. Then there's the church at Sardis, the dead church. <coughs> the church at Philadelphia, the church of brotherly love, uh, representing that period of time where the great missionary movements went forth from the church. And then finally, the church of Laodicea, the church of people's opinions. So there we have the seven churches um, in a timeline, and they represent these church, these eras of church history. Now, each of the churches got a report card, and you see the report card. Uh, they start off, there's, you know, of course, the name of the church and a description of it. There's a title of Christ, and then that title of Christ is an admonition or something that that church needs to be reminded of about the work and ministry of Jesus Christ. There are commendations for five of the seven churches. The church at Sardis, the church at Laodicea were so bad they didn't get a commendation from the Lord. And then in terms of condemnation, <coughs> five of the churches, all of them except Smyrna and Philadelphia, received a very strong rebuke and condemnation for the Lord because of things that they had done. 
So each of the letters is structured. It starts off with the commendation first, and then it will go to this phrase, but I have some things against you. And this is the Lord talking directly to these seven churches, which were historical churches at the time. Then there's an exhortation to all of the churches. So a couple weeks ago, we looked at the church in Ephesus, and now in this series on seven letters to seven churches, we're going to look at the church at Smyrna. Seconds. Church at Smyrna. Located in Asia Minor, there along the coast of the, uh, uh, the Aegean Sea, the Mediterranean Aegean Sea. And this is what, uh, let's just read in Revelation chapter 2, starting at verse 8, what Jesus says to the church at Smyrna. Revelation 2, verse 8. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, the first and the last who was dead and has come to life says this. Now remember, in each of the letters to the seven churches, Jesus gives a, a description of himself. And in this one, because the church needs to be reminded of some aspect of Christ. So because we're going to learn that Smyrna is the persecuted church, what is emphasized here, uh, the name Smyrna, it really has a relationship to myrrh. This is the myrrh plant. And myrrh was one of these spices that was used to anoint bodies that were decaying, dead bodies. So the church at Smyrna needed to be reminded that though the Lord was dead and buried, he was now alive. Because what the admonitions is, we'll see, is that the church at Smyrna was going to be known for its persecution. It was going to suffer persecution uh, for a long time. And this is a great era of persecution in the church at large. Uh, up until the time of Constantine. So, verse 9. I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich, and the blasphemy by those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison so that you will be tested, and you will have tribulation for ten days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. So the first thing that Paul or that Jesus says is that I know your tribulation and your poverty. Now the word there is ellipsis, meaning tribulation. It means a time of affliction, testing, and that sort of thing. So Paul is telling, excuse me, Jesus is telling the church at Smyrna that you are going to undergo a time of persecution. I think this letter has a lot of applicability to the world today. I know there are people that believe that the church will be out of here before anything starts to happen to the church. I cannot give you chapter and verse that it is certain to happen before the church is raptured out, but I personally as I watch events unfold in the world, I believe that shepherds in the church need to be preparing their flocks to sustain times of persecution before the Lord raptures the church out. Look around the world and look at what's going on with all the persecution that's going on in China, in North Korea, in Central Africa, in South Sudan, in Syria, in Iran, in Iraq, direct, open, hostile persecution of Christians all over the world. Given the way our culture is going, I feel it is very likely that the church in America and in the West could start to undergo times of persecution. Now, I pray that I'm wrong. I pray that we're out of here before that happens. But uh, if we are, then fine, but I think people need to be prepared for facing 
Uh, Jesus said you're going to be drugged before magistrates, kings, and judges. And it's in, or magistrates and kings. And it's interesting he starts with the legal system first. And we're already seeing starts of that as people are persecuted by our legal system here in our own country. Uh, there's an oral argument, I believe it's this week, on the Hobby Lobby case, where our government wants to essentially fine Hobby Lobby out of existence because they don't want to give pay for policies, health insurance policies, that include payment for abortions or abortifacients. And our government says, well, they're just a false entity. They don't have, they're just a made up, uh, a fictitious entity. They don't have any particular rights. They don't have a right to religious freedom. Now, it's interesting, as a sidebar, the interesting part about that case is the Supreme Court has ruled that corporations and entities like that have rights to free speech. Rights to religious freedom is in the same amendment. So some judges that have been in the Circuit Court of Appeals and elsewhere have said this is such an easy case, it shouldn't take the Supreme Court long to decide because if they give free speech rights under the First Amendment to corporate entities, then certainly they ought to give religious rights. But our government, and when you pay your taxes to, is actively opposed to this becoming the law of the land. The Obama administration is fighting it. If they lose, if the Obama administration prevails, I think you're going to see much more burden put on organizations that are consist of religious people that are owned and run by religious people to do things that violate their religious conscience. In some states, I believe in Illinois, for example, Catholic Social Services no longer is in the adoption business. Catholic Social Services for many years was the largest provider of uh, uh, babies for adoption. They're out of business now because they don't want to uh, be forced to give babies to homosexual couples but they are not allowed to discriminate now, so they have essentially ceased that in certain states. And that's coming, and so those pressures will be coming on all of us. Now, whether it gets as bad as it is in North Korea or Central Africa or other places, I don't know. But I think, look, the Lord says that we're going to have tribulation. We're going to have times of testing here. Okay, so now he talks about the synagogue of Satan. Given what Mike had to say beforehand, I'm going to make just a couple of short comments about this. Uh, there's some dis question about what the synagogue of Satan is. I think Mike went through all of the passages that I would have gone through. John is the one who wrote about, used the term antichrist. Those people who are opposed to Christ are those people who put themselves in the place of Christ. You see this in certain movements in the church today where people claim a special anointing, but they deny Jesus Christ. So the synagogue of Satan, I think the best way to describe it is someone who denies that Jesus is the Christ. And this was an aspect of Judaism at the time that John wrote this. And it's gotten worse. Jacob Prash will be here, and I've heard Jacob teach on this many times. And essentially, what Jacob, what you will learn from listening to Jacob for a while, is that the Judaism of today is not the Judaism of the time of Christ. When the temple was destroyed, they had to, they no longer had a place to do their sacrifices. So once the temple was destroyed, and I think we went up to, a, when we were in Israel three years ago, we went up to Katsrin, which is a Talmudic uh, village up in the Galilee in the Golan region. And there we, they had a nice little film, and you could see if you knew that this is what happened, they changed the religion. So the Judaism that was developed out of that region and that is predominant in the world today is not the same Judaism. It denies, for, it denies anything to do with sacrifices and certainly anything to do with Christ. And I believe that's what John is referring to when he talked about 
uh, a synagogue of Satan. Then he goes on to say this. Do not fear. Even though you're going to have tribulation, testing, persecution, do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison so that you will be tested, and you will have tribulation for ten days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Now, what do they mean by tribulation for ten days? Again, this is someone that something that different common commentators on the Bible have uh, differed. Commentators on the Bible have differed as to what this means. A good interpretation of it is that there were ten periods of persecution under the various Roman emperors, Domitian, Marcus Aurelius, Septimus Servetus, Caligula, Decius, and Diocletian were some of the prim uh, primary persecutors of the church at this time. That would be Caligula here on, the, on your left, and the center would be Nero, and on the right would be Domitian. They were active, intense persecutors of the church. The church had to go underground. You can go and look and see where they lived in the catacombs in Rome. Um, that may be a picture of what the church will have to do in the end times before Jesus returns for his church. In many parts of the world, that's already what they're having to do. And some very good thinkers in this country are saying the same thing. And I know of a pastor that is actively preparing his church for the time when maybe they won't be allowed to meet together and breaking them up into even smaller groups. So it's some of the things we're thinking about uh, here as what we might have to do to prepare if this is indeed the end times and if persecution comes uh, to America. This is a very uncertain time of world history. The only certainty is we know that Jesus will return and take care of everything, but until then, there's going to be affliction, persecution, suffering in the world. We're going to be no different, I believe, than the church at Smyrna. The church at Smyrna was told, you're going to have persecution for 10 days. We see this all over the world, particularly in, in Asia and Africa. Uh, in the Arab countries and communist countries where the church is persecuted. Uh, I could show you pictures, I could show you pictures of persecution that would turn your stomach. Uh, for example, right now there is active persecution going on by uh, Islamic groups in Nigeria. They are going into churches, locking the churches, setting them on fire, burning the people alive. They've even gone so far as to take the burned bodies, drag them over to a mosque, set the mosque on fire, claim that it was Christians that did it. That's been reported. So the church there in Nigeria is under severe persecution. Just a couple weeks ago, 115 or 150 people were burned to, to death. If they survived, they were uh, slaughtered with machetes and that type of thing. It's happening. These are our brothers and sisters in Christ. We know about the pastor that's in the Iranian prison. This is the day and age that we live in, and whether that, I certainly believe that uh, there's the descriptions of the Antichrist that he's going to, I believe the phrase is, he'll wear out the saints, if I recall correctly. Well, that means he's going to persecute them. That person who comes, who's directly possessed by Satan, of course he's going to be comfort these people. So in just conclusion, this brief look at the church of Smyrna, the church of Smyrna gets a report card. And it passed. Jesus said, you have tribulation and poverty, but you're rich. Uh, you have persecution, but you remain faithful, and you will get the crown of life. And Jesus concludes this letter where he says this, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes, 
will not be hurt by the second death. So thus of, those of us who are Christians, who have repented of our, of our sins and put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, the only way for our salvation, we will not have anything to fear if we're put to death. Because we know that we will be resurrected. We know that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That's the great hope that we have. So we should not fear any of this. Our life should be completely, totally, completely the Lord's. To do with as he sees fit to his glory. And you can read through books like Fox's Book of Martyrs and that type of thing. I won't go through a lot of those, any of those today. Tremendous stories about how people stood for their faith, even under torture to the point of death. Stood true, stood firm, they were overcomers. And that church at Smyrna, Jesus had no condemnation. He only had praise for that church because they endured that persecution and they did it to the glory of Jesus Christ. So that's our look at the church of Smyrna. Now I want to do a prophecy update today. Uh, we talk, um, as you know, most weeks about this convergence of events, and I keep trying to uh, come up with different ways to present this to you so it's not you know, the same old thing. Uh, just on a humorous note, uh, you know that President Obama always fills out a bracket and uh, it appears, too, that uh, Vladimir Putin has filled one out also. Uh, so. Yeah. And, now, and between Obama and the Ellen Show, the Ellen Show won. Now, just some significant things that may have relationship to Bible prophecy. I'm pretty sure you're not going to see this anywhere else. Um, this is China. This from Zinang to La Haza is a new railroad. It's being touted as a very stri de defensive, strategic thing for China to have this way to get people from here deep into the interior. And the suggestion of one of my friends was maybe this is the railway that might be used in the end times when the kings of the east sent a 200 million man army towards Israel to participate in Armageddon. Don't know if it is, but I'm just saying is this is something that hasn't really existed before, and now we have a way to move a lot of people very quickly by rail. Now, interesting editorial in Investors Business Daily this week. Uh, this is Alexander Solzhenitsyn. He wrote the book, The Gulag Archipelago. He was severely persecuted um, during the era of Stalin and uh, the following Soviet dictators during the days of the Soviet Union. He spent, I, I'm thinking, about 20 years in prison. He was eventually freed. He was, a, he was a dissident. He wrote from prison. He was very bold in what he had to say. He was freed from prison about 1974, forced to leave the Soviet Union, and he immigrated, came to the United States, and he lived in Vermont because the winters there reminded him of the winters in the Soviet Union. This year, he could have lived in Ohio <laughs> and been reminded of winters in the Soviet Union. I'm not sure that that's something I would really want to move to experience, but Solzhenitsyn did. He won the Nobel Peace Prize. He was very well respected. Uh, uh, the book that he wrote on the gulags, his time in the gulags, is uh, considered one of the great masterpieces of, of, lit of literature. But it's very interesting, uh, as I researched this this week, some of the ties that appeared between Solzhenitsyn and Putin. Now, you would think that Solzhenitsyn, who, rose, who, who railed against the 
uh, oppression of the czar-like dictators of the Soviet Union, Stalin and Khrushchev and those type of people, would also have concerns about Putin. But later in his life, when he was confronted about this inconsistency, he said that even, um, well, people still need a strong leader. And so he was very close friends with Vladimir Putin. Uh, when um, he was released from, when he finally, when Putin came to power, uh, and was coming to power back in the early 90s, around 1994, Solzhenitsyn was allowed to return to the Soviet Union. He moved back to the, from Vermont back to the Soviet Union and lived in a suburb in Moscow. And there's a picture of him with uh, Vladimir Putin. There's also a picture of him uh, that's Putin at the uh, coffin of Solzhenitsyn when he died, I believe, in 2008. So we see the connection between Solzhenitsyn and Putin. Now I'm going to show you the, another connection. You would be misled if you did not believe that there was a strong religious component to what Vladimir Putin is doing in the world today to try to reconstitute the Soviet Union. Putin has been very adept at using the Russian <coughs> Orthodox Church to further his ends within Russia. He does get some help from the oligarchs. He tolerates them, but when they get out of line, they go to prison. But he's worked very closely with the Russian Orthodox Church. Now, the Russian Orthodox Church, for a long time in the history of Russia, the, the Russians considered themselves as the last defenders of Christianity. The Russian Orthodox Church has an extensive history of anti-Semitism anti-Jewishness. The pogroms and things that they've done in the past have been on the order of what the Nazis did to the Jews back in World War II. This is, but this is who Vladimir Putin sees as important in his life, okay? The Russian Orthodox Church. Now this is a, a black Madonna called the Lady of Kazan. Uh, it is an icon that was created, well, this is a, a remake of the icon. Uh, the original icon was made in the uh, 16th century, in the 1500s, and it is considered to be the most venerated and important religious icon in Russia, in the Russian Orthodox Church. And you also have to know that you, it's hard to divorce Russia from the Russian Orthodox Church in people's minds. So this Lady of Kazan, it's an icon of Mary, the Madonna, was used by the Russian government in some of its major wars. It would be brought out and it would be used to bless the troops before they went into battle. So when there was a war with the, Pol with the Polish armies in about 1612, they brought out the icon, the Lady of Kazan. Uh, other wars in the 1700s, and then when they went out to defeat Napoleon, as Napoleon was invading Russia, this icon came out to bless the troops, and it was believed that this icon allowed the troops to be successful in this particular, these endeavors. In 1904, though, the church in which the icon was resident had a fire, and the icon disappeared. Nobody's ever found it, but there were, they did discover this um, remake, and it's been dated back into about the 1750 range. And so this has become the most venerated icon now in the Russian Orthodox Church. But when it was found, it didn't end up in Russia. It ended up at a place in Portugal called Fatima. And it was possessed by the Blue Army of the Lady of Fatima Shrine in Fatima, Portugal. There was a man who be, was, in his life, was very devoted to Mary. He was a cardinal in Poland. He eventually became known as Pope John Paul II. 
And during the reign of John Paul II, the icon, the Lady of Kazan, was taken from Fatima and brought to the Vatican in Rome. And when Putin went to meet with uh, John Paul near the end of John Paul's life, uh, in about 2003, you can see here in the picture on, the, on your left, Putin is looking at the icon. And here in the picture on the right, you can see the icon on the table there behind the Pope and Vladimir Putin. If you went to the Pope's private chapel, you would see the icon. And John Paul was known to write that he prayed many times to this icon for peace in the world. In 2004, not too long before John Paul passed on, there was a special ceremony at St. Peter's where this icon was given a special veneration by the Pope. It was the goal of John Paul that he take that icon personally back to Rome, or to Russia, and present it to the Russian, the Patriarch of the Russian Orthodox Church. He was never in health at that time to, he never had good enough health at that point to travel like that, but it was given to a cardinal who took it, presented it to the Russian uh, Orthodox Patriarch in Moscow. Now listen, John Paul, even though there have been some evangelicals, many evangelicals, who have venerated him as a, or spoke of him in very glowing terms as a very evangelistic pope to further the gospel, you need to know that this man was devoted to Mary. And in fact, on his coffin was a cross and an M. And that stood for totus to us, Mary. Totally yours, Mary. This man, who claimed to be the bishop, the vicar of Jesus Christ, on his coffin, in his will, had instructions that he was supposed to be buried with the phrase, totus tuus Mary, on his coffin. He was devoted to Mary. Now, the Bible tells us that Mary needed a savior just like us. And I believe the Bible. I don't believe the nonsense that Rome teaches about this. So this, this icon was taken and it was put in a church uh, that is in the Kremlin in, um, in Moscow today. Now, why is this important? I uh, noticed in this Investors Business Daily uh, editorial, I think it was this past Wednesday, that what Vladimir Putin did about a month ago was he took the icon from its place in the church, put it on a plane, and flew it over the Black Sea and Crimea and other places. Now, the reason a lot of people believe that he did that was he wanted to bless that area of southern Russia because of the Sochi Olympics. Now some people, and I agree with them, are rethinking it that Vladimir Putin had this invasion of Ukraine planned all along. And he did like other Russian czars had done in the past. He pulled out the icon, took it out to bless the troops or the area where the people were going to invade because they venerate this icon. Supposedly this icon got its veneration because there was an apparition of Mary that came and said, oh, this is, this is my icon, and you should worship and venerate this icon. This is a false, demonic, evil religion. It's what a coming world leader is going to do. And whether any of the players on the stage right now are that person, you need to understand that that spirit of Antichrist that Mike talked about so capably in the first hour is permeating world leaders today. And one of them may be in a place to rise up and claim, I'm the one. So that's why it's significant. So this Crimean thing, 
Um, these titles, This Land is My Land on Time, The New World Order on the cover of The Economist. Uh, Robert Kaplan has an interesting article in Time about, it says here, Russia, Crimea, and a return to the old world order. Back in 1989, when the Soviet Union collapsed and the Berlin Wall came down and people were, that had been oppressed were, then, were now free, and evil leaders like Ceausescu and Romania were slaughtered by their people for the crimes that they had done, a lot of people <coughs> used that as an opportunity to point to people who taught about Bible prophecy and say, See, you guys were wrong. You said that there was this Soviet <coughs> Union was going to come down, lead a coalition, invade Israel in the last days, and the Soviet Union has gone to history. And you people are fools for believing that Ezekiel 38 and 39 is literal. I heard it. God operates in his own time. And whether it's Russia or a reconstituted Soviet Union, it does appear that those things are being put in place to happen exactly as the Bible says. So, and Kaplan goes through this article. It's a fascinating article. It, it gives some legs to the concern about there'll be wars and rumors of wars. It looks at Ukraine. Uh, he talks about, is Putin now going to move into Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, and Poland? And those countries are relatively defenseless. They're up there on the northern European plain, that area that we talked about, I think, last week, Mackinder's pivot point of history. And they're defenseless. I mean, the Russian army would roll over those places in a day or two and take them over. Is that what Putin has designs on? I don't know. Well, Talk part, of, of, part of the problem is those are part of NATO now. Part of the problem. I'm not sure you say part of the problem is that they're part of NATO, Estonia, Lithuania, and Latvia. So if they roll over, if Russia were to take those over, then they'd actually be confronting NATO. Putin would be confronting NATO. So what? Um, yeah, so what? Do you, do you really think that he has any fear of uh, Europe, Europe, which really doesn't have an army, and the United States, which is cutting back on its army? that we're going to do anything about it. I know that it would be a violate, you know, we, as NATO countries would have to come to the defense of them. But I don't know. I don't know if that's Putin's design. But Putin appears to have designs on reconstituting the Russian, the Soviet Union, at least in some fashion, if not directly, at least indirectly, taking control of these countries again. He said himself, when the Soviet Union collapsed, that it was the greatest catastrophe of the 20th century. It was worse than the Holocaust of Hitler. The collapse of the Soviet Union was the greatest catastrophe of the 20th century. Uh, we also have Libya. That's not really a state anymore. Uh, Libya is coming apart. Of course, we have Iraq. Uh, here's just a brief uh, clip of uh, George Friedman of Stratfor and Robert Kaplan, who's their chief uh, geopolitical analyst at Stratfor now, talking about uh, talking about uh, Iraq and the Arab states. My, na my name is George Friedman, and I'm here with Robert Kaplan, my colleague, and we want to talk a bit about Iraq today. Robert. Uh, yes, I think the question, George, is does Iraq have a future as a state? Iraq was, was formed, as you recall, in the early 20th century by the British, which united a Kurdistan, uh, a Sunni center, and a very tribalized sh uh, Shia south. They wanted to unite the oil fields of Kurdistan with the waters of the Persian Gulf, partly as a way to buttress British India. So they put together three different peoples who one could argue at least two of them, uh, at least one of them, the Kurds, didn't go together with the other two. Uh, what happened was Iraq had a very uh, messy de partial democracy for decades up until 1958 when the king was overthrown and murdered. 
Uh, then we had a succession of military dictatorships, one more brutal than the other, and each one foundering on his inability to control the Kurds. Uh, finally, it all, it all culminated in Saddam Hussein, who was, by Middle Eastern standards, probably the most uh, overwhelmingly totalitarian ruler in the region, uh, comparable with a Ceausescu more than with any Arab ruler. And he was that way because of the kind of state the British put together, putting together odd groups that only a really repressive dictator could control. So we have to ask the question, now that the whole thing came apart, and now that we see continued fighting in the western Iraq, in Anbar, in Fallujah, in, in, in Ramadi. Uh, does Iraq have a future, or will, can it only be an Iranian protectorate, or something like that? Well, it's a very interesting discussion. You can go to the Stratford website um, and look at it. It's about nine minutes long. It's, it's very fascinating because it gives you sort of a historical background of how Iraq was formed, how the Arab countries are all kind of fighting with each other. Uh, but it does have, it's, it's interesting, I'm always fascinated when secular people swerve into areas of Bible prophecy. And the area of Iraq is where Babylon was, and it may be, I think it is very significant from a prophetic standpoint. Exactly what's going to happen there, I don't know. There are people who believe that the Antichrist that's coming will be from the area of Assyria, which is northern Iraq, up near the Kurdish region. Uh, for all intents and purposes, the Kurds have an independent state now within Iraq because the Iranian or the Iraqi Iraqi central government is not strong enough to control the Kurds in the north. They're also very oil rich. Uh, they have a lot of money, uh, and they're the largest ethnic group on the planet that doesn't have their own country. So we see everything kind of fracture. And remember, Iraq has fallen apart because we went in there. We broke it. Uh, and it was set up, you only could have a brutal dictator to do that. It's the same thing with Assyria, or Syria. You could only have that country put together because of the various ethnic and religious groups that reside there with a brutal dictator in charge, like Assad, and the father of Assad who really brought it all together. So it's a very interesting geopolitical study. You also have Burma, which is also uh, coming apart as they're going through the beginnings of trying to establish a democracy. It occupies a very significant geopolitical place between the billion plus people of India and the uh, millions uh, millions of people that live in Southeast Asia. You also have the Central African Republic and the South Sudan, where Islamic rebels have come in, and now there's a lot of conflict between Christians and uh, Muslims in that, in, especially in the Central African Republic. You also have uh, tensions between China and India. The Himalayas kind of keep them apart, but they're still trying to work out their relationship and. Don't know if that would erupt into a war either. And then you also have uh, China making designs on the uh, South China Sea and taking over and controlling it. And Kaplan, who writes about all of these uh, things going on in the world, and concludes with this, um, the vast human cataclysms of the 20th century will not likely repeat themselves. But the worldwide civil society that the elites thought they could engineer is a chimera. The geographical forces at work will not easily be tamed. While our foreign policy must be morally based, the analysis behind it must be cold-blooded with geography as its starting point. In geopolitics, the past never dies and there is no modern world. And he's very critical of our government. Then Investors Business Daily had um, an editorial this week about this. Russia and Iran growing closer. That has, I believe, very clear prophetic significance. It really does. So we live in exciting times. I have a lot more. 
but since I'm going to do a prophecy update Saturday morning at the prophecy conference, I think I'm going to say that. What I'm going to focus on in that update is some things that happened in Bethlehem about two weeks ago at the 2014 Christ at the Checkpoint conference. It was the third Christ at the Checkpoint conference. The things that were said there by people who claim to be evangelicals are absolutely mind-boggling. They are, it's hard to believe people believe the things that were said there. There were numerous attacks on Christian Zionism, people who believe that Israel, geographic, ethnic Israel has a role in the end times. That's clearly what the Bible teaches. The people that spoke there and the people that support Christ at the checkpoint, like Lynn Hybels, like Bill Hybels, of Willow Creek, like Tony Campolo, like Brian McLaren, uh, Shane Claiborne, all these people who are sort of stars in what's known as the Evangelical Church are all big supporters of Christ at the checkpoint and their vehement denial that Israel has any prophetic role in the end times. They deny Bible prophecy, they deny the role of Israel. The fact that Israel's reconstituted as a country is merely an accident of history. The fact that that is growing within the Christian church and becoming a fairly predominant view is itself a fulfillment, I believe, of Bible prophecy. We'll talk more about that on Saturday, but before I go, anybody have any questions? Yes, sir. The icon, was that literal, looked like a like a picture. That yeah, was, that's an icon. That was it. That was right. The <laughs> they say that an icon is written. They make an icon, they make the frame, and then they put the picture of Mary in it. And the whole thing is called an icon. And it's just that one that was sitting there. It's not copies well, of it. Well, there might be other copies of that particular icon, but that one is the one that's now resident in the Kremlin. That's the one that well, the original was destroyed or lost back in 1904. This is the replacement one that's been around since at least the 18th century. But it's the most venerate, it is now, because of what the Pope did to venerate it, and the Pope using it in his private chapel to pray to for many years, John Paul II, it's now the most venerated icon in the Russian Orthodox Church. And Putin took it and flew it around the Black Sea region before he invaded. This is what the czars used to do. So uh, suppose if he takes it out and flies it down towards Israel, then you ought to really get excited. Yes, ma'am. Could you elaborate on why you think the relationship between socialism and Islam is so important? Because that's something that we don't really understand. Well, the Solzhenitsyn, the, the question was, why is the relationship between Solzhenitsyn and Putin significant? It's significant in the fact that Solzhenitsyn wrote from a perspective of somebody that we would like to see in the West, that he spoke out against the oppressive czar-like rule of the Russian, the Soviet Union dictators. He came and he lived in America. He seemed to function well in America, but when he went back to Russia, he changed. And so I think what I would take away from that is here is the, um, I hate to use the term icon now, here's the icon of freedom that comes out of the Soviet Union. He goes back to Russia and he supports a czar-like ruler like Putin because it's something, it's almost as if it's built into the Russian psyche. So that's why I think it's significant that the leading proponent of freedom goes back and supports a thug like Vladimir Putin. So that's why I think it's significant. I, I just think as you're seeing all of these countries kind of uh, constitute themselves, align themselves, all of it lines up with what prophets like Ezekiel said a long time ago. I mean, I could go on, as you probably know, I could go on for a couple hours just talking about the things that are going on between Israel and the United States and Israel and uh, the so-called Palestinian people 
and the things that are going on there about a peace agreement and the things that are being said and the things that our government does. And we'll take a look at that on Saturday. That's probably going to be the focus. Christ at the checkpoint and the current sort of Israel, U.S., European Union geopolitical arrangement. Very exciting time to be alive. Uh, so let's, it's time to leave, so let's pray. Lord, thanks for the opportunities that you bring our way, Lord. We pray that you will use the things that are said and done at the Prophecy Conference uh, this weekend to your glory. And Lord, we pray that you will use that to change hearts and mind, minds and help people to be informed and get motivated to be prepared for the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Just pray that you will bless that conference and those that speak at it. Um, and pray that you would protect all of those who are assisting in the final preparations and volunteering to help at the conference themselves. Pray for safe travel for our speakers uh, and that you'll lay the right messages on their hearts to present. Uh, we ask all of this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.